speaker. Uh, today we welcome Dennis Whalen as he brings us back to 1889 with a walk through Queens. A founding member and former president of this society, now we're celebrating 25 years. That was 25 years ago that Dennis was the president. <laughs> Dennis was born and raised in Bermuda, later resided and restored two historic homes in Queens Hamlet. His uh, interest in local history began with conversations he had years ago with Ed Gettings. If you're familiar with Ed, he wrote the Queens of the Past book. And at that time, Dennis also began collecting postcards and other materials related to the town of Queens. In 1998, he, uh, I've already talked about this, but he was one of the founder members of the Bermuda Women's Historical Society and served as the president. So please join in welcoming Dennis uh, to speak. Thanks, Joe. It only seems like 25 years ago. <laughs> Started the center for us. Uh, just give me a heads up when you're ready. So this afternoon we're going to take a walk through the 1889 streets of Queen's Landing and Queen's Junction uh, to learn about the people and their lives, and we'll be guided by the early bird's eye view. Queen's Landing and Queen's Junction. Uh, things were different uh, then. It was before paved roads, sidewalks, electricity, telephones, and cars. Um, it was a busy place, um, and uh, just about anything you needed to keep the household to work uh, or to run a business was within walking distance. Um, at this time, your livelihood was largely dependent on the work generated as a result of the landing's location on the Hudson River. Uh, but it was only up the hill uh, where Queen's Junction uh, was starting to come into its own, where the West Shore Railroad had made its way to the junction uh, just a few years before this uh, lithograph. Um, the lithograph was produced by the Burley Lithographing Company in Troy. And uh, Lucian Ronaldo Burley uh, was born in Connecticut, graduated as a civil engineer uh, from the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. And while he was there, he studied under a famous professor who specialized in field sketching, so going out into the uh, open and doing sketching. And Burley became one of his prized students. Uh, which no doubt influenced his career. Uh, he graduated at the time when there was a business slump, uh, and uh, work for civil engineers was not plentiful. Um, he moved to Milwaukee, where he put his mechanical drawing skills to use. Uh, he returned to Connecticut in 1878, and it was there that he began producing views of towns and cities. Um, he moved to Troy in 1880 and established his lithographing company there in 1886. Um, he described his process as taking a bird's eye perspective uh, view from between 1,500 and 2,000 feet in the air. And he would first outline the major topographic features, uh, the roadways, and uh, he would then walk the streets, uh, sketching out the houses um, and the other structures. Um, he produced 228 views of towns and cities between 1886 and 1889. Uh, these were largely of places in uh, New York State and Vermont. Uh, but he also produced lithographs from other artists. Uh, the Smithsonian has a collection of 163 of his views, including a copy of the Queen's lithograph. Um, the Queen's Herald in May 8, 1889, announces that uh, Burley was here in Queemans and made a fine and very accurate pencil sketch of Queemans and Queemans Junction. Uh, they said every house in its proper shape, showing windows, doors, are so clearly displayed that a child conversing with the place can pick out their homes. Uh, the completed lithographs were delivered uh, four months later in August of 1889. Um, fortunately for us, uh, the lithograph at the bottom has a key uh, that lists 30 businesses, churches, uh, public buildings with corresponding numbers on the lithograph to locate them. 
and we'll use that as the guide uh, for exploring the landing and junction of 1889, along with a few detours uh, as we go along. So number one is the Dutch Reformed Protestant Church of Queens, located here on Church Street. Uh, the building was constructed in about 1840. It's still standing today, um, a landmark on Church Street. Um, the original church was located in Queenman Square, uh, so the area that we're in right now in Queenman's Junction. Uh, it was constructed in the late 1700s there, and an 1813 gazetteer uh, described Queenman Square as a little village of 12 houses. Um, so if you can imagine the Ravina area with a church and a few other things and, uh, and 12 houses. Uh, I think the church and the burying ground uh, was located in the area that's sort of bounded by Main Street, uh, Route 9W, and Moxley Street. Um, so in that area there. That building was torn down in 1853. Um, number two, again on Church Street, is the Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, this church was built in 1838. Um, this site is the successor of the Old Stone Church. Uh, this is a drawing that someone did at some point, uh, constructed in about 1792 on land donated by Levi Blaisdell. Um, that site is off Fuller Road. Um, so if you go out Winnie mm -hmm. Avenue, uh, where it crosses 9W, Fuller Road is directly across the way. Um, the Old Stone Church was a key site in the Queenman's Methodist Circuit, uh, which was reported to be the first Methodist church uh, built west of the Hudson River. Um, this is the Stewart's Book uh, for the Albany Methodist Church uh, Circuit, and it contains the early records of the Queenman's Circuit, where the services were held, who attended, uh, what donations were received, uh, who got banned from the church for doing something <laughs> else. ridiculous. Um, this book's from my collection. It includes records uh, for the Old Stone Church. Um, this page you can see um, services in March 19, 1808 at Queenman Stone Church. And then uh, another page, interestingly enough, uh, records all the donations that were collected on the Queenman Circuit. Uh, you see the name Louis Seville um, here at the top, uh, father of Acton Seville, um, who will we'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, church is uh, still standing on Church Street, now used as an apartment building. Uh, number three is St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church. Uh, if you attended Joe's talk a few weeks ago, or a couple months ago, I guess now, uh, you heard him give the history of St. Patrick's, uh, now located on Main Street uh, in Ravenna. Um, the church here was on a ledge overlooking the Hudson River. Uh, on the road to Grove Cemetery. Uh, it was built there in 1852. And as Joe told us, uh, when it opened, over a thousand people um, attended the opening uh, in 1852. Um, the current church on Main Street in Ravenna was built in 1917. Um, number four, we're going up back up to uh, Queenman's Junction. And uh, it's this structure right here, which is the uh, Christian church. Um, the church grew out of a missionary project, um, and it was organized on September 23, 1888, in Vincent Hall, uh, which was in the Hotel uh, Vincent, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. Uh, Reverend Morgan was the first pastor, and that church started with 23 members. Um, the site was purchased in 1888 from George Adrianitz, uh, and the total cost of putting that building up uh, was $4,718. Um, it's located at the intersection of what is Main Street and Mountain Road. Um, you know, 30 or so years before this, uh, this was the site of Schofield's harness making shop um, at that same location and, and somewhere in between the church and the harness shop, uh, the Jenny Lind Hotel uh, was located. Um, at the same place. Um, this area is also the location of some older structures uh, that I want to talk about. Um, two inns uh, were located in this area. Here's, this would be um, 
Main Street, and here is the intersection with 9W. So 9W being the King's Highway, uh, you know, you'll hear it talked about in early uh, records as the road from the Sopus, so Kingston basically, to Albany. Um, and uh, two inns located here, I'm no longer there, neither is there any longer. Um, I don't ever remember a structure sort of being here. This would be kind of in between where the Sitco gas station is and Martin's Motel ice cream uh, parlor. Uh, and that was the uh, that was the inn operated by Samuel and Mary Lodeman um, as early as 1797. And the other was um, a house that existed for quite some time, um, sort of right at the corner um, of uh, the Joab uh, Baker uh, in operating as early as 1798. Um, there's a shot of it. You may, you may recall that it burned down uh, several years ago. Um, number five is the Queen's Public School, which was located on Church Street um, in Queen's. So uh, we saw the Dutch Reformed Church uh, here, the Methodist Church, and now a little further up. Uh, the uh, Queens Public School. Um, the cornerstone for this building uh, was laid in 1878, and the Queens Herald reported that uh, there were several speeches that Mr. Acton Seville um, approached the scene in great haste, but uh, gave a speech to much applause, and uh, rejoicing among the assembly, offered to donate $50 to expand the property to include a playground. Um, there were other, uh, you know, so you think about this 1878, but um, you can see here's a paper they have from the Albany Gazette in 1803, uh, where Queemans is advertising for a schoolmaster. Um, and private schools were also available. So here in 1886, um, a private school operated in the Bailey Building, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit, um, where you could send um, you know, students who had rough paths, they would be made smooth, and darkness brought the light. Uh, particular attention given to backward students. Five dollars uh, for, for a quarter. Um, the building uh, that we're talking about, Whitbeck Hall, um, uh, was purchased uh, by P.A. Whitbeck. It became Whitbeck Hall and was used for meetings and things of various sorts. Um, this happened when the school moved to the Civil Academy, or what we know as the Civic Center. Uh, Whitbeck Hall was later sold to the American Legion, um, and after their first New Year's party in 1933, uh, they burned to the ground the next morning. Uh, here's a photograph of the happy students in <laughs> <laughs> this public school out on the steps. They were probably happy to get in class for the day. Um, and while we're here, I want to talk about the house um, up above. So uh, higher up on the hill on Church Street, um, the house um, that's pictured here. Um, this is the Abraham Hotel House. Um, it's not certain who built the house. The rear portion um, of the house is, uh, predates the front of the house. Um, it was occupied for many years by uh, descendants of the Hotel family. Uh, ben Blaisdell family members. Uh, Shirley Briggs lived here when she was a child. Um, C.F. Sutterly um, then purchased the house uh, and uh, we got it at some point and lived there for more than 20 years. <laughs> um, Abraham Conrad Hotelman uh, was born in New Baltimore in 1798. Um, he came to Queens as early as 1820. Uh, he was married to Charlotte Helen Bronk. So the great granddaughter of Peter B. Queens. So uh, his children uh, were descendants of the Queens family. And two of those children, uh, pictured here, Anthony and Charlotte Amelia, um, lived in this house for many years. Um, Neither was married. Um, I mentioned this house and the Queens connection because this was the home where the portrait of Ariadne uh, Queens were blind, hung for many years. Uh, it came down to Charlotte in some manner uh, or form as she was the last to own the painting that was in Queens. 
Um, and there are two stereographic views, um, one that shows the portrait leaning against the side of the house uh, uh, next to the side entrance door, and then another um, showing a gathering of folks with the portrait against the house in the background. Um, Charlotte is pictured here, um, and I know we have a we have a painting of Charlotte somewhere in the in the museum, um, and uh, the portrait hung between these two windows um, in the parlor. These may be other descendants of the Queen's family. Um, it's simply unlabeled, and I have no clue as to who they are. Um, but when we were renovating uh, the parlor um, and uh, redoing the walls. Um, we when uh, uncovered right here in between the window were two giant iron hooks uh, that I suspect uh, were for hanging up the uh, hanging of the portrait. Um, number six is the Queen's Junction School. Um, this is the location just about where we're sitting. Um, uh, the school at that time was much closer to uh, to Mountain Road. Um, the property was purchased for $250, um, and the boundaries included property of the White Elephant Railroad. Um, so the railroad um, sort of followed this line of what is Western Avenue, uh, eventually hooking up with the uh, track near Winnie Avenue. Um, and also mentioned a stream um, uh, headed in an easterly direction. And I know when I was a kid, we used to, anybody who lived in this, this area would take a shortcut through here. Um, and in between the house, there's now a house painted red uh, over on the side. And there is, a, there is a culvert through there with water running through there. So my suspicion is that that, that streamlet you know, hooks up somewhere along the line um, and crosses over and continue to run down through this area here. It still runs occasionally. Uh, uh, down through there as a storm sewer. I think in these days it was more like a regular sewer because uh, there's plenty of attention given to it by the Board of Health. Um, I think there was an earlier school um, at the junction because the newspaper reports uh, them auctioning off a school lot uh, once this was constructed um, in 1889. Uh, there's a shot. Uh, of it shortly after uh, being built. Um, number seven is uh, Seville Academy on, uh, on Westerlo Street. And uh, much has been written um, about Acton Seville's efforts at establishing the school, its failure to open. He didn't leave any money for its operation uh, after, its, after his death. Um, it was eventually taken over by the uh, Queen's School District. Um, a remarkable building and, and undertaking. Uh, here's an early shot. You can see Acton Seville uh, name uh, there, uh, but eventually taken over by uh, Queen's School District. Uh, but I want to focus uh, to the east in this area here. Um, so this would be uh, Westerlo Street. This would be Seville Avenue. This would be Blaisdell. So this area right here um, is where Frangella Drive uh, and other buddy your houses. My house is right, right, right <laughs> along here. I would be there. Um, and this is described um, in uh, papers in 1878 as Seville Park. Uh, and it was developed by Acton Seville. It had formal sidewalks, uh, land, special landscaping. It had carriage and riding paths. Um, there were three paths, formal drives. Um, and Acton Seville declared it would, the gates uh, would be open for public use um, at all times. Um, so while we're here just to talk about uh, Acton Seville, he was born in Queemans in April 1805. Uh, his family was not wealthy. Um, like many in Queens at the time, he looked to the river uh, to make his livelihood. Uh, he began as a deckhand and a cook on one of the river boats, uh, usually sleeping on board of uh, the deck. And as the boats frequently landed in New York City, he got a job there as a clerk uh, in the Seaport District. 
uh, in a store there. He worked his way up. Um, after a number of years, he started his own ship chandlery business there and then a wholesale grocery business. Um, he sold out those businesses um, to a firm uh, that we now know as AIG, an investment group. Um, he then invested in real estate, and by the time he was 50 years old, he was one of the wealthiest persons in New York City. Um, he owned many properties in Midtown Manhattan, uh, which is now in Midtown Manhattan, on the Upper East Side. Uh, but he always maintained a strong connection uh, to Queens. Um, in 1846, um, he purchased this property, uh, sort of overlooking, you can see how dominant this is in the, in the landing area, uh, overlooking the, uh, the village and the river. Um, and he and his family spent summers at this home, which they called Mount Pleasant, um, and sometimes Mount Prospect, uh, there's an early mention of it, uh, invested a substantial amount of money in redoing uh, this and continually adding new features uh, to the home. Um, after his death um, in uh, 1889, his family continued to visit uh, Mount Pleasant, but it was eventually put up for sale, uh, purchased by Andrew Vanderzee, who continued to refer to it um, as Mount Pleasant. Um, the other Seville home, just further up on uh, Church Street, is what is known as the Seville Valley Home. Uh, this was the uh, home of Atkins' uh, brother, Theophilus Seville. Um, number eight is the business at the dock of Henry Slingerland, uh, referred to as Captain Henry Slingerland, uh, located right on the docks at the, uh, at the waterfront. Um, the Slingerland home was just a short walk away up on First Street. Uh, Captain Henry Slingerland was born in Albany in 1830. He lived in Westerlo for a period of time and then went to work for a shipping firm in Baltimore, uh, eventually becoming a junior partner and a senior partner. And that firm bought out the property of Johnson and Schoonmaker, which was located down on the docks in Queens. Um, he soon had one of the most prominent businesses uh, on the Hudson, a shipping farm and dairy products uh, to New York City. Uh, these storehouses were massive buildings uh, for storing hay, grains, and other materials um, that would be taken uh, by boat. Uh, so farmers and mills would be shipping this down to uh, the Queen's Landing, uh, then loaded on boats. There's the steamer Lada uh, that we'll talk about again in a bit, um, right, in front of the, right in front of the warehouses on the dock. Um, and then uh, everything shipped down to New York City by barge um, to be sold. Um, they also took passengers um, and uh, to and from New York City. His barges would leave Queens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, arrived in New York City early the next morning. Uh, the return trips left New York City uh, the following afternoon on the way back. Um, as you can imagine, with warehouses packed with hay, uh, this is one of the barges. Uh, similar to those used by uh, Henry Slingerland. You can imagine that um, the threat of fire was constant uh, for these warehouses. Uh, the buildings and contents were usually insured, but at a fraction of what their actual full replacement value was. Um, the Slingerland's business began at the dock in 1867, and throughout its life into the 1900s, these warehouses were completely destroyed by fire five times and rebuilt. Um, on each occasion, the losses of the warehouses and sometimes the barges uh, totaled $50,000, wow. uh, typically with insurance coverage in the $20,000 to $30,000 range. So this was a uh, major endeavor. There's a shot of the Slingerlands fired down at the dock. Uh, you can see the bags of grain barrels uh, um, Captain Henry Slingerland uh, and his family lived in a brick home with a mansard roof on First Street uh, in Queens. A couple of early shots uh, of the home. Um, that home stood on First Street for many years. Um, it was abandoned uh, and then later demolished. Uh, the leaking roof uh, simply made it, uh, made it unstable. Um, number nine on the map is 
the business news of Richard S. Blodgett, located here, sort of in between the Briggs Ice House and uh, Sling Owens. Uh, Richard lived in this house uh, up on the corner of uh, Main and uh, Church Street. Uh, Richard Blodgett was born in Queens Hollow. Uh, he was the son of Woolsey Blodgett and his wife, Catherine Soup. Um, you know, if you go out uh, through Queens Hollow, you know where Blodgett Hill uh, Road is. Um, he twice served as town supervisor and he was town auditor um, at the time of his death in 1919 at 86 years of age. Um, he was in the long run coal business uh, for many years. And uh, while we're down at the waterfront, um, I wanted to point out two other buildings that had me, had me puzzled. Uh, because, and it's uh, this right here, which you know you can see looks sort of like a barge uh, up, on the, up on the ground. And then this uh, little building in between what was the J and Briggs house uh, and another house. You know, by the way, back in these times, nothing ever got wasted. Um, a lot of buildings and cleanments got moved around. This is where the gazebo is right now. And it had two houses there. One of these houses was moved to the other side of the Briggs house here. Uh, this house was moved down here. This is Brad Winnie's house. Uh, moved down uh, closer to the, to the floodplain. Um, but these two buildings, when I was reading an article in the News Herald, um, it mentioned this, the Globe Hotel and restaurant situated on the lower deck and owned by Charles Johnson. Charles Johnson was from Kuksaki, uh, was almost completely submerged. And I was trying to figure out what this was. And I took a look at, um, you know, the Sanford Company issued fire insurance maps uh, in the late 1800s. Um, and I noticed when I looked at it, um, that building described as a restaurant. And this other building described as an oyster saloon. <laughs> and uh, so looking back through the, through the Queeman's Herald, um, you know, I found out more about the globe. It seemed like a pretty rough and tumble place. <laughs> uh, and the, the, you know, the Queeman's Herald folks had a lot of tongue-in-cheek comments. You know, this is one, a row at the Hotel de Globe. Uh, Sunday afternoon, furnished another victim for the doctor's needle and thread. <laughs> so I think this, I think the Globe was sort of a place uh, where, you know, if you're working at the dock or you're coming in on a boat, you can grab a drink or, you know, maybe flop into a bed <laughs> if necessary. Um, it uh, was then reported that uh, Charles Hazelton um, took the Globe down um, and transferred it to his farm up at the north end of, uh, of the landing village. Uh, then when I looked at this shot of, uh, of one of the floods, uh, this was in 1891. Um, uh, or no, maybe a little, yeah, 1891. Um, so, you know, the river, the flow of ice, uh, because of the shoals in the river here, from the earliest days and descriptions of Queemans, and I'm talking into the 1700s and, and forward, um, flooding was always a problem. The ice built up Barren Island, it was sort of backed up. Um, and so typically around this time of year in March, um, there would be floods of various sorts. So this shows the one in 1891. This is the Briggs, the Brick Briggs house uh, right here, which is undergoing renovation, um, I noticed. But, uh, and this had been Brad Winnie's house, you know, sort of moved to the other side of this. Um, but if you see this building here, you can just make out the word restaurant uh, there, which is where the, uh, where the oyster saloon was. Um, and I think that was the location of Ziegler and Long's Oyster House um, in Queens. Oh, we could get all sorts of oysters. Chowder was a Saturday evening feature. And just like today, orders filled and delivered to any part of the village. <laughs> Same grub hub. Um, number 10 is the uh, ice coal and uh, Northern River Bluestone business of John Newton Briggs. Um, JN, as he was known, was born in Queens in 1838. Um, he 
he was the son of Albert Newton Briggs and Maria Andrews, which was from Stevensville, um, as Alco was then known. Um, J.N. was a tough character. Um, he was a hard-nosed uh, businessman, uh, keen and entrepreneurial. Um, when you think about all that he did, um, he purchased his father's general store and bluestone business, um, and then moved into the coal trade um, in Queens and in Albany. Um, here's an active day at the Queens Bluestone uh, Yard uh, down at the uh, at the dock um, in Queens. This bluestone quarried out in Stephensville, uh, shipped down to uh, Queens. Um, he purchased uh, Barren Island in 1879, developed it as a popular excursion destination. Uh, there's an exhibit on it uh, over in the corner. Uh, if you want to take a look at that. Um, in 1891, he began his ice business. Uh, he invented many tools and patented tools of various sorts uh, for harvesting and, uh, and moving ice. Um, this was dangerous work. Um, there's an article in the paper every week uh, during the winters about horses or men falling through the ice. Uh, most were rescued, um, some were not. Uh, but you think about you know, cutting these pathways um, and the river and they would be harvesting uh, these blocks of ice that were described as 10 or 12 inch blocks. Um, so related to the thickness. And floating them along these pathways and moving them into the into the ice houses. Um, there's another shot you can see. You know, first job was removing the uh, was removing the snow, uh, and then you divide up into these pathways of ice, and then cut the individual blocks up and sort of move them along. Um, they would then move down these pathways, cut into the uh, into the ice, and onto these conveyor belts, uh, moving them into these massive uh, storage houses. Um, the ice houses on the waterfront um, and islands of uh, Jan's could hold um, more than 100,000 tons of ice. Um, he also owned storage houses in New York City uh, where the ice would be shipped um, and sold. Um, he, was, he started and was the largest stockholder of the Atlantic Light and Power Company that generated electricity for Queen Virginia and in Baltimore. Um, and uh, he was a competitive businessman, but uh, also a staunch advocate for his hometown, where he continued to reside his, uh, his whole life. Um, number 11 is the Tobin House, uh, right here on the corner of First Street and Westerlo Street. Um, this uh, provided rooms for rent um, and the saloon on the, uh, on the street level. Um, it was directly across the street from the Getty Hotel. Um, so right down directly on the waterfront, um, two mm -hmm. establishments where you could find a, find a room, uh, entertainment, and libations of, uh, of various sorts. Um, it was formerly called the Whitbeck House. It was owned by Bert, Bert Mike Whitbeck. Um, and uh, he continued to operate, even after he sold the building to George Tobin, he continued to operate a a sort of wine and liquor um, store uh, on the ground on the ground floor there for many years. Um, this building uh, was built on what is believed to be the approximate site of the Queen's <coughs> Castle. Um, that building, uh, Tobin House, is uh, thought uh, to have been constructed by Josiah Sherman following the demolition uh, of the Queen's Castle. Um, Tobin House is still standing. Uh, on the corner of uh, Western Law and First. Number 12 uh, is this so a little building kind of tucked in here behind the Getty Hotel. So Getty Hotel, right on the corner, it had stables and other rooms uh, behind it, uh, but then sort of right on the corner of First Lane, well, which I should mention was also called Gazette Street uh, because the Queen's Gazette uh, first newspaper started in this area. It's believed perhaps in one of these buildings here, not certain. Uh, but uh, this is the tin shop um, operated by J.P. Holmes and Son. Um, so here's an early photo. Uh, uh, and uh, 
Jacob Bradwell Holmes was born in 1826 in Quaymans, the um, son of Elias Holmes, who was born in Quaymans about 1788. Um, as early as the 1850 federal census, he was identified with an occupation of Tim Smith. Um, he married Laura Tuttle uh, of Solomon and Martha Tuttle, uh, daughter of Solomon, born in Queens, 1807. Um, the sign was J.B. Holmes and Son. Uh, his son, Warren B. Holmes, um, joined him in, uh, in the business. Um, they specialized in just about anything to do with metal. Creating and assembling uh, things. They also handled, you know, things made of metal stoves, ranges, heaters, bicycles. Was a big business in Queens in the 1890s. Um, there was even a special column in the Queens newspaper at that time about bicycles and cycling, uh, keeping track of all the events and races and who had the newest, uh, who had the newest uh, bicycle. Um, this is the residence. Of uh, Warren Holmes, and um, right here next to the Getty Hotel. Um, so it's kind of a short walk uh, through the backyard to the tea shop. Um, interestingly enough, Warren Holmes married the daughter of Samuel Getty, uh, who operated the Getty Hotel. So Warren married uh, Molly Getty. Uh, that house is still standing. Street. Looks a little better than it does in this, <laughs> in this shot. Sorry about that. Um, number 13 is the grocery store of uh, Long and Van Heusen. Um, this business continued into the 1920s. Um, it was run at this time by Henry Long and uh, William Van Heusen. Um, Henry Long was born in Alsace, France, came to Queemans um, from his uncle's home in Rensselaerville. And, uh, and a stint where he worked uh, for Henry Slayerland in, uh, in New Baltimore, um, and, then, uh, and then came to Queemans. Um, uh, William Van Heusen was a Queemans native. Uh, his uh, family lived here for many years, but within a few, within a few years he left the business and uh, it became H. Long and Son. Uh, you can just uh, make out, so here's a shot of Lower Westerlo Street. This would be the river uh, here. This is looking up <coughs> Westerlo Street. Um, so this is the Keller Grocery I'm on the north side of Westerlo. And in a, in a better shot, you can make out the H. Long and Son sign um, on this building right here. So sort of direct here's First Lane or Gazette Street comes out here. Uh, and uh, H. Long and Son Grocery on the corner. It's a little better visible here um, as you're looking up Westerlo Street. This is the tin shop uh, that we talked about. This, I think, is the Hollenbeck um, stage. This is a covered sleigh that ran from the docks up to the West Shore uh, Railroad Depot in, uh, in Queen's Junction. Uh, <coughs> these houses, this is the H. Long uh, and some grocery building. Um, these houses are now taken down. Um, this string of houses, I think, were some of the oldest um, in the landing. Uh, there's now a, I guess it's a storage parking lot or, or something like that uh, that's constructed here. But it was a string of uh, three or four houses with the Tobin house uh, sort of over in this, uh, in this area here. Um, number 14 is up on the corner of Main Street and Westerlo. Uh, it's the Hotel and Hotel. And at this time, it was operated by Richard Hotel and son of Aaron Hoteling and Cherry Soup, who were the first proprietors of the hotel. Um, Aaron was born in Queens in 1803. Both his parents were natives of Queens prior to the Revolution, so very early family. Um, he served in the State Assembly, uh, and his establishment was the site of many meetings, uh, sort of conduct of uh, village business, parties, entertainments. Um, this includes the formation um, in 1875 of the Queemans Union Anti-Horse Thief Society. <laughs> um, it cost $2 to join as a member. Uh, they met like clockwork, 
and if you miss a meeting, it was a 25 cent fine. <laughs> um, and the Queen's Herald um, said that um, in return, if you had a horse stolen and were a member of the society, quote, 20 members of the organization hold themselves in readiness at a moment's notice to mount their steeds and proceed at once with all possible speed <laughs> under whip and spur in pursuit of the stolen horse and thief. <laughs> uh, sparing no effort to capture the same. Um, there's no record that anybody ever <laughs> chased a horse thief. Um, but some of the reports in the meetings made it seem like they were a little more social entertainment <laughs> than even conducting serious business. Um, this is another shot up on Western Street. You can see the hotel. Um, here it is today. Um, number 15 is the Queenman's Herald building. Um, so originally the Gazette, you know, started um, down here, Queenman's Herald, uh, in this location. It subsequently moved and constructed a new building here. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit. Um, and, that, and that building, the new building, will be constructed in the same year as the, uh, the working ground. Um, so Edward and Stephen Henry Sherman were born in Queens. They were the sons of Gardner Sherman and his wife Rhoda. Uh, they launched the Queens Herald in the March 20th, 1873 edition. Uh, and the Queens Gazette, published then by Thomas McGee, was still being distributed um, and sold in Queens. But McGee had moved from Queens to Greenbush uh, and was sort of simultaneously um, publishing the Greenbush Gazette um, and the Queen's Gazette. And more and more of the coverage in the Gazette sort of drifted away from, uh, from Queen's and eventually faded away. And the Queen's Herald became the paper of record for the landing. Um, it was eventually sold and became the Review News Herald, which is still published today. Um, the Sherman's father, Gardner, was a boatman um, on the Hudson. And it's clear in every issue uh, that you read uh, that Edward and Henry were lovers of the river um, and the boats. They, they kept track religiously in that newspaper of all the movement of boats on the river. Um, they were also strong advocates for the betterment uh, and improvement um, of the community. Um, here are the Shermans standing with, and I'm sorry for these photos, but they're old and so they're not great, uh, but um, Henry and Edward this is Romaine Carhartt, I think, standing in front of Romaine Carhartt's um, store on, uh, on Main Street. Um, in addition to the newspaper, they featured specialized printing of all types. Um, here's a couple examples. One with Bill Head with this sort of fancy gold uh, ink and then a, uh, a ticket and invitation uh, to a moonlight excursion from Queen's Landing uh, on August 20th, 1879. The invitation must be shown at the gate of Bittens. Um, and uh, so they uh, published everything from handbills and billheads for stores to voting slips uh, and, uh, and other things. Uh, this is the Queen's Herald building still standing on West Low Street. Um, so down here would be the Hoteling Hotel. So as you pull up the street, this is sort of the next building uh, behind the hotel. This was the new building that they built. Uh, its original location was down here. Uh, there used to be a historic marker down there, I think, uh, Still designating, there. The, designating the building. Uh, but then when the Queen's Roughway Fire Company bought their first motorized fire truck, um, they took over the Herald building and they moved it up to the corner. Uh, this is Main Street headed down toward New Baltimore. This is West Willow Street headed down to the river. Still there, uh, now used as a parking building. Um, so six, number 16, um, sort of right up the corner, uh, is the L.E. Gould and Sons Meats, Fruits, and Groceries. Uh, this was the establishment of Lucius Gould, um, who was born in Clarksville in 1829. Uh, he was a butcher in Indian Fields in Queens Hollow. Um, and then in the 1870s came to Queens with his family and opened a grocery store, um, which was located 
um, in the brick building uh, that uh, Andrew J. Wolf had just erected, so in the same year as the lithograph, uh, just up from the corner of uh, Main and West of those streets. Uh, at this time, the store was run by his son, uh, Joseph Eugene Gould, who was also the postmaster. Um, the store was the first one in Queens to have cold storage uh, for keeping uh, meats and fruits. And uh, the brick uh, wolf building, which was erected in 80, 1889, um, replaced the old wolf home, uh, which was located on the same site. Uh, that was one of the oldest buildings in Queens. Um, when it was torn down, a um, coin uh, dated 1790 was found uh, and planted on the foundation. Um, here's a shot probably in the 19, late 1920s, early 30s. I'm um, looking up Main Street. Um, there's the New Wolf Building uh, located there. Schaefer's Millinery Store located next door. Uh, there's a uh, gas, gas operation. Today. Mm -hmm. While we're down in this area, um, I should say the Gould House on Church Street. Um, it's not shown on the map. Um, it was built in 1890, so a year after the lithograph. Um, this was the home for many years of Bobby Shirley Briggs. Mm -hmm. um, so, sort of across from the, uh, from the Methodist Church. Um, but while we're sort of down in this area, I wanted to talk a bit um, about um, this, this section and you know some of the oldest buildings. I, you know, I think now that these buildings have been torn down, these frame buildings behind the Tobin House, um, sort of the next oldest set of structures um, in various ways is kind of along the Church Street. You can, you can imagine, right, if all the dock area was down here. You know, this would have been a very active corner. Unlike today, where most of the traffic comes down Church Street and heads to Albany, and these days, West Willow Street is the main drag uh, because people were coming down to the docks. Mm -hmm. uh, but this house right here um, is the house of Levi Blaisdell, uh, the northwest corner of, uh, of Western Willow and Main. And uh, it's believed to date to about 1785. Um, this southern portion right here uh, was built first. Um, the northern section, called the Music Hall, uh, was built next. It also had this L addition um, off the back. Um, this house was a center of activity in the early days. It served as a store, a post office, meeting place. Um, this picture shows, you can make out Frank Leading's name. Uh, so he was running a grocery store um, uh, here at this point in time, probably right about, probably right about the time of the, uh, of the lithograph. Um, shot of a uh, silhouette of Levi. Uh, he wore ruffled collared shirts uh, and uh, had an old hairstyle. You can't see the sort of, I want to call it a uh, mullet. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the, at the back of his neck. Um, I should just say that um, you know, as you head up uh, Western Oak Street here, uh, these stairs and this walkway. This was the embalming rooms of uh, the Southers, Alonzo Southern. Uh, you know, in those days, most funerals took place at the home, uh, but bodies bodies were treated and, uh, and, and embalmed in the rooms there. Um, house is still standing. Um, and uh, this is a this is a shot. So I think you know where we are sort of up here on uh, Mount Pleasant, where Atkinsonville's house was. Right, this those lands were completely surrounded by fencing and stone walls, and we're looking down at the river. Uh, there's Barren Island. Uh, this is the back of the music hall. So that's that big. Uh, northern section of the, of the structure there. Um, you can sort of see this would be the old wolf house 
uh, right here, you can just make out the sign for Romaine Carhartt's uh, store uh, here. But, uh, you know, the music hall was uh, used as a place of worship. Um, so lots of records of visiting clergy coming. Um, this may have been before the Stone Church uh, was put in place, services being held here. Um, Levi had lots of leaseholds um, stretching out toward Greenville and beyond. Um, so hay and grain uh, were stored uh, on this open, fully open second floor um, in the music hall. Um, all sorts of public meetings and uh, entertainments of various types were held there. Um, the Women's Herald in December 1884 has the following item, quote, the roller skating rink in the music hall is pronounced a nuisance by those residing within a radius of 40 yards. <laughs> so, uh, you know, everything happened uh, in the music hall. Um, across the street from that, um, on the other corner is the uh, drugstore and the medical offices of uh, Dr. Henry Niles Johnson. H.N. Uh, Johnson was born in Queens in November 1852. He was the only son of Noble H. Johnson um, and uh, Anna Niles. Uh, he attended Rutgers uh, College, got his uh, MD from Albany Medical College. He started in partnership with Samuel Powell um, in the drugstore and then eventually took it over here where his medical practice was also located. Um, he died young, only 45 years old. Um, during his time, he um, was very interested in the history of the village. Um, he investigated, he collected various uh, papers and deeds. Um, he wrote about Queemans often in the Queemans Herald, um, the history of Queemans and the Queemans family. Um, uh, Unfortunately, all his papers were destroyed um, uh, after, his, uh, after his death. A uh, big loss. Um, here's another shot of Westerville Street. Uh, we saw the, this shot before the Kelton Grocery. Uh, here's someone bringing a delivery down to the docks. These buildings um, are the American Hotel uh, run by the Cronk family. Before the, uh, before the American Hotel was run by the Niles family, called the Niles House. Uh, those buildings um, are still standing. Here's a front shot of the Keller Grocery. Uh, this would be the tin shop. Uh, First Lane or Gazette Street would be coming out right here. Uh, the Quinn's Bakery, a little further up toward, this was right behind Johnson's drugstore building still standing. Um, again, you could get hot breakfast rolls delivered to any part of the village. Uh, um, <clears throat> Peter, you know, Peter Van Korn ran the bakery at that time. Um, he was also engaged in the broom uh, manufacturing business uh, along with the Ziegler family. Um, this is an 1866 uh, map um, uh, the red locations are room factors uh, in um, You know, a few years past this, and another 25 years, uh, the Corps would take over Queen's Academy. Uh, here is a broom factory. Ziegler's would have a broom manufacturing over this area. So it was big business in, in Queen's to grow, um, harvest uh, broom corn, uh, and then manufacture them into, uh, into the rooms. Um, American Hotel, there's a shot of it today. Uh, roof line a little different, you know, changed all the time. Uh, there's the bakery building, uh, right behind the building that's still in the corner. There's the, the corner building, and the bakery would be right here. Here's Keller's Grocery looking down toward the river. Here's the same shot. Here's Keller's Grocery still standing today. Down toward the river, these are the buildings that have been demolished for that parking lot or storage lot. Closer look at those there. Right? So, H. Long and Sun Grocery right here. Okay, let me catch up here. So, this is the uh, 
number 17 on the map is the Storm William Snyder. Uh, the Snyder family came from Becker's Corner in, in Bethlehem to Haynes in the 1860s. Uh, William Snyder was a shoemaker, also ran a shoe, shoe and clothing store. Um, it was always located on Main Street. It moved around in a couple places. Ended up being in the Brick Wolf building um, that we talked about before. Um, number 18 is uh, on the, on the uh, map shown as William uh, Bailey, the jeweler. Uh, and uh, William James Bailey uh, was located in what has been called the Bailey Building. was a Civil War veteran, uh, came back to Queens, became a jeweler and engraver, um, also sold you know, clothing and other sorts of notions uh, from his store in the Bailey building. Um, his father was a wheelwright, um, and he built carriages and slaves, uh, first in Bethlehem, and then in uh, and, uh, These had a great reputation, were in high demand. Um, William's brother, um, John DeWitt Bailey, uh, worked in his father's shop and became an expert at finishing and painting uh, carriages and slaves. Uh, his work also in great demand. Uh, always people were coming from throughout the area uh, to, have, uh, to have John uh, paint and decorate their slaves and carriages. You know, like many people in Queens, um, if your work was seasonal, um, you had lots of different jobs. And uh, John DeWitt Bailey was appointed by President Ulysses S. Grant to be the lighthouse keeper um, in Queens. And given the tricky nature of navigating through Queens, um, Hudson Waters, the volume only taking place, this was a serious responsibility. Um, he had this job for more than 30 years. Um, the Bailey Building, still standing today, um, served as the location for numerous stores. Um, <coughs> Crandall's Night School, Dr. Elliott had his office here, uh, and uh, Miss Ostrander's Art Studio for Ladies uh, was located here. She came from Skodak uh, to give lessons. Uh, the Wolf and Hathaway, Hathaway Bicycle Emporium, uh, as well as housing. Uh, so this was a a very active site. Uh, the Bailey family lived up on Church Street in that uh, house that Theophilus Hill uh, resided in, a uh, house still standing. Uh, and located, this is sort of right across the street from the, uh, the Dutch Reform Church. Um, number 19 is uh, W.B. Hole, uh, a store he lived on Church Street. We'll talk about that. Uh, this was William Barrett Hall. He was born in Greenville. And while teaching at the Aqueduct School, um, he met and married Carolyn Vandersee. Um, they moved to Tribes Hill in Montgomery County, then Queens in 1847. Uh, he served as postmaster for 24 years, starting in the 1850s. And with his brother-in-law, uh, Andrew S. Vandersee, uh, operated a dry goods store. Um, sort of had a statewide reputation as an expert in Sunday schools um, and was called on frequently to address um, conferences of uh, Sunday school teachers um, when they gathered. Um, he lived on the corner of Fifth Street um, and Church Street in a house that's still standing. This was Zelda Yutzi's house. Uh, you may recognize him as that. Um, he died in 1890. His son was a physician uh, who practiced a bit in Queens uh, but uh, was mostly based in Schenectady. Um, as we head up to Queen's Junction next, I just want to make a few comments about, uh, about getting there. So, so Main Street in Queen's uh, was uh, called the Post Road to Albany uh, and the Albany Green Turnpike, you know, basically headed from, uh, heading from New Baltimore uh, up to Albany. Um, in the early days, uh, Westerlo Street was known as the Aqueduct Path right, because it was the pathway that he followed to get out to Aqueduct. Um, it was in, in this area uh, called John Bronx Lane. That's John Bronx Early House. 
110 Main Street Marina located there. Um, I should say as we move up through this area, for many years this area was known as the Oklahoma District. Mm -hmm. I have no idea <laughs> why it was called that, maybe it's sort of a reservation attitude. Uh, and if you think about um, this as South Clement Avenue, so sort of headed up the hill to the, where the falls were. Um, I always knew this as McCabe's Hill. Uh, sort of clear water street being here. Joan near I built a house right at the top of this. At this time it was called Indian Hill. Um, I guess because of presumed uh, Indian, uh, Indian settlement there. Um, the toll gate um, was at the junction of the turnpike, Westerlo uh, Turnpike Plank Road. And I have Dave, you've written about this. About this a bit, Dave. Uh, Tollgate, uh, <laughs> the Beck House. Um, um, again, nothing wasted. So when toll stopped in the early 1900s, um, these buildings were disassembled. Um, information I have is that part of it went to this house on Edna Avenue. And part of it went up on Main Street to the Nunziato House. This would be sort of across from Ted's Barbershop, Jordan's Barbershop uh, area on Main. Uh, but as we get up there, um, this is number sort of 21, 22, 23, um, all involving the businesses of uh, Peter Pulver. Uh, Peter Pulver was uh, from New York City, possibly there involved in the oil business in some way. Um, he made a, made a rapid mark at Queens Junction, um, taking advantage of the development of the railroad. Um, he purchased uh, about five acres of land from Peter Seabridge, and uh, in 1883, he quickly um, had the Pulver House uh, built and the, and the brick buildings um, next to it. Um, Pulver House was a center of activity in Queens Junction. It was outfitted with all of the uh, things you can imagine, a restaurant, rooms for rent, the meeting hall, smaller rooms for various activities. Um, here are two shots. This is the dining room of the Pulver House, uh, decorated for something or other. And this is the reading room um, in the Pulver House. Uh, he also built the Junction House. This would be further up Railroad <coughs> Avenue. Um, fronting on Central Avenue, and this was behind the West Shore Railroad, uh, Railroad Depot. It was used by the railroaders, so you could get a room, um, you could have, a, you could have uh, meals there, um, and you could have Hankel's Lager if you wanted as, as well, which I'm sure was probably a popular choice. Um, the, the Pulver Block, um, so this, let me get this photo first, this is the Pulver House. And this building was built directly next door. At this time, the post office was here, and Arthur Hart's store was here. These were meeting halls upstairs. Um, for years, this was the meeting hall of the International Order of Bond Fellows. Uh, but at this time, there was a bridge constructed between the Pulver House um, and this next Pulver building, uh, leading right onto the second floor. So guests uh, could move from you know a dinner uh, into, a, into a meeting hall um, in the building next door. And this shows the third part of the pulpit block. This, this building is this one right here. And this is, uh, you know, for years it was Makeley's garage and Kearney's garage. I think now Peter Bullock has his, uh, has a, his electrical uh, company there. Another shot of the Pulver House. And uh, and the key is number 23, which is the meat market of Henry Hempstead, uh, of H.S. Hempstead, sorry. This was Harvey Hempstead, uh, born in Queens, 1866. Uh, when Peter Pulver built the Pulver House, um, he built a building directly behind it. Um, in this photo, it's the Pulver House stables. Uh, but before this, it's where Harvey Hempstead operated his meat market and Bill Pavlor operated a shoe store. Uh, that building was torn down in 1892. 
um, so that these barns and stables um, could be constructed there um, to serve the hotel. Um, Harvey moved his meat market up to the Vincent Hotel, um, sort of on the corner of Main Street and Central Avenue. Uh, you can picture this is where sort of the monuments are now, and there's a parking lot. For years, this is where Alice Pemberton lived. And so that's what I remember as a, as a kid. Um, it later became the Park Hotel. Uh, but there were stores of some sort in here. Uh, and uh, Harvey Hempstead moved his meat market here. Uh, Bill Pebbler moved back to Queemans on Western Oak Street with his shoe business. And then was built the Pebbler Block building kind of right across the street from here uh, on Main Street. Uh, number 24 is the West Shore Railroad uh, Company Depot. Uh, this was the first train station um, that existed on Railroad Avenue. Um, the railroad was responsible for eventually shifting you know, the center of commerce and business away from Queens Landing up to Queens Junction. Um, the first train came through um, in 1883, so about six years before the lithograph. Um, there's the train station, quite the building. Too bad that had to go away. Uh, the train station that replaced this is a sort of over behind. Uh, village Hall, a uh, little nondescript brick building that the village uh, now uses for storage uh, purposes. Um, you know, when the railroad came through, here's a picture of the railroad crossing Main Street. So it was at street level. Um, and it wasn't until September 1902 when the road was lowered um, and the viaduct was created uh, so that the road um, went underneath. Numbers 25 and 26 are the complex of buildings of the Cider and Vega Mill, uh, way up on so this is sort of the area where uh, the mushroom plant had its cannery and laboratory. Uh, this is now a block of it has its electricity, has its electrical business area. Um, it's an herbal tea place now. What is it? Herbal tea. Herbal tea? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, John Ward was from Westerlo. Uh, he was a farmer in Westerlo. Uh, he married Cecilia Kiefer, daughter of John and uh, young Kiefer, Kiefer's Corners. Kiefer's Corners was a part of Quaverings, uh, sort of out next to Indian Fields. It's kind of the intersection of Copeland Hill Road and 32. Um, John was a, was a farmer and had manufactured cider and vinegar on his farm. But when he saw the West Shore Railroad being built, um, you know, in the fall of 1885, he purchased land adjoining the tracks um, and established this factory that sold uh, vinegar and cider to the New York City market. He also built a freighting business, um, so carrying goods uh, from here down to New York City. Um, handling hay, straw, apples, uh, thus competing really with Henry Slingerland's forward business down in the docks. Um, his partner, Alvin Nodine, uh, was born in Queens. He was a graduate of Albany Law School. Um, he's probably more of an advisor, um, an investor in the business. Um, he traveled extensively and owned farmland in Kansas and corn groves in California. Um, you can still see the Nodeen house if you're going out 143 and you're kind of making the turn up the hill to the hollow. The Sycamore Country Club is on your right. The Nodeen house is on your left. Uh, right there. Um, number 27. This is not numbered on the map, but uh, number 27 is identified as Captain Charles Redfield Hitchcock, and this was his house. So if you think about Acton Civils, Mount Pleasant, and Andrew Energy, um, this was sort of over on the side of the lot, uh, up, up on a pretty steep embankment. There's Fifth Street uh, going over to church and Westerlo Street here. Um, uh, he was born in Albany and began his career as a boatman on the Hudson. Um, he was a steamboat captain, including for the Lotta, which we'll, which we'll show in a bit. Um, in 1881, he married Emma Hotel, uh, who was the daughter of Richard Hotel, uh, the 
prior to the hotel hotel. Um, he rose in ranks of the Hudson River Steamboat Company, uh, which ran all of the boats between Albany and Catskill, uh, and uh, all points in between. And um, the Hitchcock House is still standing today. It's kind of hard to see um, as high as it is up there. It's not, uh, not a great, uh, great view of it. Um, <coughs> while we're talking, sort of Dutch looking fellow here. Um, you know, while we're talking about this area of Westerlo, so here's Upper Westerlo Street. Um, Captain Hitchcock's house would sort of be up here. Um, and here are the road of turns. Um, and this is the CF Surgery House, uh, which we'll talk about. This guy's having a good time, a good time but obviously accompanying his load of hay down to the, uh, down to the docks. Um, and He's sort of right about here. There's Captain Hitchcock's house. There's the C.F. Sutterly house, uh, which we'll talk about, and the Warren Wolf house um, that we'll talk about also. Um, here's another shot before. Um, so this, uh, this house was uh, uh, purchased by Conrad Frank Sutterly, uh, who was born in uh, Sotheby's. 1855. Um, he worked in his father's bakery store there. Um, he became involved in the brickyard operation uh, down in that area in Glasgow. Um, he moved to Queens in 1887 um, and worked with John Sutton um, in the brickyard in Queens. Um, he married Alice Sutton, um, John's daughter. Um, and upon uh, Mr. Sutton's death, he became the president and general manager of uh, uh, the Sutton and Sutton's early brickyards. Um, he was also president of the Bank of Ravina um, since its start in 1909. Um, another shot of the house, you can see this was after considerable work was done to create that, uh, that porch and all of the terracing, um, which you can see on the Berlin lithograph um, as well. See it? Uh, his son, C.F. Third, on, on the house that I lived in that we showed over the portrait of Mary uh, Architect Queen's son. There's a shot of the house today. Um, amazingly, you can still see terrace and left. Mm -hmm. uh, just to talk, uh, so Calvin Avenue, pretty unpopulated at the time. And Warren Wolf in 1889, so the year of the lithograph, uh, purchased a lot and built a house. I uh, probably bought this lot from his brother, A.J. Wolf, who was living at uh, the house we'll talk about in a second, uh, down on Main Street, the Wesley Blaisdell house. And uh, Warren was quite the guy. He was an inventor. Um, he was an engineer, uh, ph photographer, uh, marine engineer, uh, businessman, avid bicyclist. This guy was into bikes uh, substantially. He married uh, Sarah Frances Wagner from Queemans, and after their wedding on May 20th, 1884, they left the reception on a tandem bike. Uh, <laughs> there. and, and there's all sorts of reports in the paper. They would take a trip out to Queemans Hollow on a bicycle on the weekend. Um, and uh, represented a number of bicycle companies as a dealer. Later in the Bailey Building, open Wolf and Hathaway, which did plumbing um, as well as making sure to stay in the, uh, in the bicycle business. <coughs> um, the Queen's Herald in 1898 reported that he had just completed the Queen's Special, uh, which was a bike that he, uh, that he put together and made himself. I don't think this is it. This is a Queen's photo, uh, but I like to think it might be. <laughs> Not sure who that is, by the way. Not Warren Wolf. Here's a shot of Warren Wolf and Sarah. Um, and you can kind of see in the background would be the scene of Sutterly House uh, that we looked at with the terrace lawns. Uh, they're kind of a kitty corner across the street. And interestingly enough, a tandem bike uh, in the background. Yeah. yeah. There's the house today. Um, another shot sort of looking at the C.F. Sutterly house 
Um, this would be Calvin Avenue that runs along here. A couple other older houses uh, along this stretch right here. Um, this is the Southern House, kind of on the corner of Fifth Street and Westerwell. Captain Hitchcock's house is right here. This, I think, is one of the early broom manufacturing shops of Peter Van Korb um, that was attached to the house. House still exists mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. I noticed, by the way, this, this photo has to be like 20 years old. That car is still there in the same place. <laughs> 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 Just to look down at the, at the waterfront. Um, yeah. Um, so on the lithograph, um, you know, it shows the Briggs business, but a number of boats in the river, all, all of which would have been familiar uh, to Queenan's residents at the time. Um, this, is the, this is the propeller tugboat Susie Gedney, which was owned and operated by A.J. Wolf. Um, this is one of the barges that either J.N. Briggs, probably J.N. Briggs at this time, or uh, Henry Slingerland um, operated. Uh, making trips twice a week to New York City and back. Um, this little steam launch here is the Greta um, that was built uh, for J.N. Briggs. And he used it to ferry passengers from uh, the dock at the landing down to Marina Park, uh, back and forth. Um, this is the Lada steamer that was part of that uh, company that uh, Charles Hitchcock operated. Um, it ran between Albany and uh, Queens and New Baltimore um, on a daily, daily basis, making several runs. And this is the paddle wheel steamer of Hudson, uh, which was part of the Catskill to Albany line. Uh, it landed in Queens at 8.30 a.m. and 4 p.m. every day, on the way back and forth. There's the Susie Gedney. Um, that's A.J. Wolf. In the pilot's seat. Uh, his brother Wayne, both before, that's Barrett tonight. Um, I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> this is the steam launch Greta. Got sort of that fancy uh, trim uh, around the top. This is the small dock down at Barrett Island. Uh, there's a shot of one of the barges. So similar to the one on the, uh, on the north of the this was at This was at a time when this would be an excursion from Albany to Barren Island. Uh, here's a shot of the city of Hudson. Oops. Uh, so uh, we talked about the lot. There's a ticket so you can you know, go to Albany Queens back and forth. Um, but it left Queens at 7.25 a.m. They also obviously had special, special events. Uh, James Maxwell, Queen's resident, who was the captain of the Maxwell, the Alana at the time. Here's a shot of the Alana. So, um, A.J. Wolf, uh, Andrew Jackson Wolf, uh, we'll talk about uh, here. Uh, he's listed on the map as a steamboat proprietor, um, and you saw him in the pilot. Susie Gedney. Susie Gedney was a tug. It was known up and down the Hudson. Um, uh, it was called the Susie Gedney. Susie, it was later called the Annie. Um, and uh, eventually ended up walking down by the uh, Poughkeepsie Railroad Bridge when that was built uh, to help the boats navigate um, through, those, uh, through those waters down there. Um, AJ um, grew up, made his living on the Hudson. Um, he was a uh, well-respected man, active in affairs. He was president of the Board of Education, uh, trustee of the Methodist Church, trustee of Grove Cemetery, and more. Um, he married Annie Colvin, um, and they lived in the Colvin house um, after uh, John Colvin passed away. Um, this is the, on Main Street, and sort of known as Maplehurst. Um, show you Picture, picture of that um, house today. So still, still stand 
many still in good shape. Um, it was it was a group home um, at, at one point in time. Uh, now it's a police precaution. Bernice precaution bought it. Now owns it, and that's you know. And she's she's a Slingerland's descendant. Okay. <coughs> makes sense then. And then um, we'll sort of end a uh, brief look at uh, Dr. Benjamin Friedenberg, uh, whose home and offices were located right on Main Street and Church Street. Uh, you know, if you think about this now, the bridge is in a different location, right? The bridges are sort of straightened out. Um, you come down, and as you're going up Church Street Hill, there's a, there's a little intersection there, right? There's a, there's a way to turn it up. So if you're headed up Main Street, and that's that's where this roadway was at the time. Um, so that smooth curve as you go up the hill did not exist. It was a sharper turn um, to head up Church Street, and this is where Dr. Friedenberg's home was, uh, office, and sort of outbuildings and, uh, and barns. Um, so Benjamin Friedenberg was uh, born in 1797 in Ghent. Uh, he studied medicine in Columbia County and took his examinations at the Vermont Academy of Medicine. Uh, in 1823, so very early on, he married Anne Verplank uh, from Queens. Uh, she was the daughter of Isaac David Verplank in the Lena Hotel. And they resided in Queens. He practiced medicine here for 64 years. Um, he was a tough cookie. <laughs> um, he served as a volunteer surgeon in the Civil War. Um, he was a respected physician and joined the Albany County Medical Society. And he was held several offices there. He was its oldest member um, for many years. Um, so his home, you know, literally on, oops, on Main Street, uh, Queen's office, a little further up the hill, you get a better perspective of the rise. As you're headed up the hill, there's one of the outbuildings office at uh, Dr. Friedenberg's uh, home. Um, in 1840, uh, there was an article in the Albany Evening Journal from anonymous individuals um, that said when they were taking the steamboat Illinois down the Hudson, um, they looked up and saw as they were passing Queens uh, to where the William Henry Harrison rallied the Catskill. I saw a red petticoat hanging in Dr. Friedenberg's <laughs> window. And the red petticoat at that time referred to an incident um, in Andrew Jackson's cabinet uh, where the entire cabinet resigned um, in protest uh, of the marriage of the Secretary of War, John Heaton, uh, to Peggy O'Neill. The wives of the cabinet members um, felt that Peggy O'Neill did not meet the moral standards of a cabinet wife. And in Harrison's 1840 campaign, um, Andrew Jackson was supporting Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren was the only cabinet member who did not resign uh, from, uh, from the cabinet in Jackson's time. And so um, uh, Jackson was supporting Martin Van Buren. So red petticoats were used um, as a political statement to remind voters that Martin Van Buren was being disgraced um, by, uh, endorsed by a disgraced president. Um, the article concluded by saying Dr. Friedenberg should henceforth be known as the petticoat doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, the very next day in the Albany Argus, um, a rebuttal appeared uh, noting that Dr. Friedenberg had disavowed any knowledge of the incident. Um, had been out of town on medical business on that day when it supposedly occurred. And the paper noted that Dr. Friedenberg's rebuttal was a keen rebuke uh, to the miscreants uh, who were circulating this scurrilous, scurrilous uh, rumor. Uh, as I say, Dr. Friedenberg was, was a tough old bird. Um, the location of Dr. Friedenberg's house, and you notice a widow's walk. Uh, was the subject of turmoil between neighbors. Um, the lot across the way was owned by John Gibbons, uh, a builder. And the building uh, built by John Gibbons is known as the Spike House. Um, the story is that John Gibbons had been feuding with Dr. Friedenberg and felt he could get some money out of him by selling that lot 
across the way to preserve Dr. Friedenberg to be with the river. And he threatened Dr. Friedenberg if he did not purchase the lot, he would build the building there. And Dr. Friedenberg you know, took the position that the lot was impractical, hard to build anything on that lot given how steep, uh, how steep it was. Um, to save face, the Gibbons had to, felt he had to build the building anyway, uh, despite Dr. Friedenberg. And so the Gibbons building, um, known as the Spite House, is uh, still standing today at the foot of Church Street. Um, you sort of notice this, right here's a flat roof, but this, the front of this sort of odd pen that, that leaps up here quite a bit, quite a bit, could have been to try to block Dr. Friedenberg, uh, but I don't know. Um, there's the building today. Anyway, yeah. I can't miss it, you sort of go down Church Street and run right into it. So over the next several years, um, Quinn's Junction uh, became Ravina. It was uh, officially named Ravina in 1893. Um, interestingly enough, the village wasn't incorporated for about another 20 years, and it took several votes because it went down. Uh, the vote went down against the corporation a couple of times, and it went close to official, but continued to grow. Um, you can really see you know, these auctions occurred uh, for all of these lots and houses, uh, and houses sprung up. Uh, Queen's Landing um, also continued to grow, even as the center um, of uh, commerce gradually moved up to the and West Shore Railroad. But, you know, we're fortunate to have that lithograph uh, to be able to go back in time and you know, understand a little bit about some of the people and things going on. That's it. Thank you. Very good. Um, some of these pictures um, Ed Giddings gave me. I'm sure. I'm sure the society has some of them as well. Wow. And more, really. Um, my grandfather was Dave Perry. Yeah, Dave owned up and, and that, house Yes, he did. He owned that, and I wasn't sure about that. But, uh, we talked about this before. Yeah. And uh, he was, then when they changed the road and they took the church street, so he made the turn there. They right. took his house out. That's when, that's when he moved his down to South Main Street. And he had a barn like this shop and everything. Else. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, after Dr. Friedenberg, it may have been owned by the Holland Dex, but then, then the Harry's owned it. Yeah. And I think they changed that curvature in 1924. Uh, it's just about that it's been enough time that that happened. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Any other questions? Corrections? <laughs> <laughs> nice job. All right, thank you, Dennis.